This is the story of the Mass Fusion Energy Company. We learned their story when visiting the Mass Fusion Building, one of the tallest skyscrapers in downtown Boston. If you come here early in the game, you find that it is inhabited by gunners. There are gunner barricades outside the building and many high-level tough gunners inside. But you likely came here while completing the primary quest. If siding with the Institute, you come here to retrieve the beryllium agitator, which the Institute needs to jumpstart their fusion reactor. If you sided with the Brotherhood of Steel, you come here to get the Beryllium Agitator to jumpstart Liberty Prime. How can the Beryllium Agitator start up his reactor? If Prime's reactor is a campfire, the Beryllium Agitator is like a match. Strike it, throw it on the logs, and the whole thing ignites. Fusion reactors need a massive power surge in order to get the reaction started. Once it starts, it's self-sustaining. Quinlan dug up some dirt on a company called Mass Fusion. They were a power utility company before the world went belly up. The CEO was some kind of an inventor. Dreamed up all sorts of nuclear power toys. The agitator was his crown jewel. Records show he was working on it in his lab at the top of their high-rise in the financial district. That's where we're headed. Hope you don't mind a little company, because I'm coming with you. It's your funeral. Well, with a big bad soldier like you watching my back, that's not gonna happen now, is it? When you arrive, you find that agents from the other faction, either the Brotherhood or the Institute, has already invaded the Mass Fusion building and killed all of the gunners. It is now your task to destroy the agents from the enemy faction and retrieve the Beryllium Agitator. But we're concerned about the pre-war history of this company, this building, and the people who worked here. This story is told through a whopping 16 different terminals that you can find in the Mass Fusion building. Mass Fusion was founded by a man named Carl Oslo. Formerly, he worked as an electrical engineer with Poseidon Energy. In the spring of 2043, he decided that he had had enough with Poseidon Energy and the way they did things, and he left the company to found mass fusion. While Poseidon Energy focused on fossil fuels like coal and oil, Carl Oslo decided that nuclear energy was a clean, plentiful energy that could replace fossil fuels for the entire world. He wanted nuclear power to warm the hearths of every home in America, starting with Boston. He called this the Clean Power Initiative. After decades of work, by the year 2070, Mass Fusion had successfully become the primary power provider for all of Massachusetts. As bright and hopeful as this sounded, we learn from the customer service station that things did not always go according to plan. They had scripted responses for people who came in wondering why their street didn't have any power and why their home did not have any power. The technology worked by placing a fusion distribution box in every single home. Mass Fusion reassured all of their subscribers that the fusion distribution box is completely harmless. They admit that it does give off a trace amount of radiation, and they say that there are some side effects which are completely normal and not worth worrying about. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, fever, dizziness, disorientation, weakness, fatigue, hair loss, poor wound healing, low blood pressure, and even skin flaking and burns. Of course, if customers experienced any of those issues, Mass Fusion does not accept responsibility. They say, these symptoms are in no way related to our clean power technology. Now, it's clear that over the many decades from when Carl Oslo left Poseidon Energy and when Mass Fusion became the default power source for all of Massachusetts, Carl Oslo became a different person. He left Poseidon energy filled with youthful ambitions and with the best of intentions. But we learn that by the end, he was colluding with the United States government, who had hoped to use his technology for war. Mass Fusion made the beryllium agitator to cold start fusion reaction. This is what allowed the Clean Power Initiative to function. The lead researcher on this project was a scientist named Noel Chandrick. He led a team of many scientists who worked hard to develop the beryllium agitator because they too believed in the promise of clean renewable energy. We learn from the development manager's terminal that Noel Chandrick was a good boss, or at least it appears to be that way. He heaps heavy praises upon his employees who do 
diligent, productive work. He sends many messages to another scientist named Kathy Hathaway, praising her for her work on the beryllium agitator. She's a dedicated employee. And even when Carl Oslo makes outrageous demands, insisting that things get done quickly, Kathy leaps to the challenge and gets it done. Because of this, Noel Chandrick recommends to his boss, Mr. Goldberg, the development lead, that she receive a promotion. This doesn't sit well with some of the other scientists, including Mr. Denvers. Apparently, Kathy hasn't been working for Mass Fusion for very long. He's jealous that, in his words, Kathy just waltzes in here and steals all of the glory away from him. Denvers says that he's been slaving away at this project for three years, and he doesn't feel like he's getting enough recognition. We get a slight impression from Chandrick's terminal that he may have a bit of a crush on Kathy Hathaway. I may be reading too much into this, but he seems to be heaping praise after praise upon her while ignoring all of his other employees. Chandrick and his team were kept in the dark about how the beryllium agitator was going to be used. At the top of the building, there is an executive suite, which worked as a mini lab for Chandrick. We find a fusion reactor there and lots of computer equipment. This is where the beryllium agitator was originally kept while Chandrick and his team were working on it. When the Brotherhood of Steel sends you here, this is where they think it's at. Only after exploring the executive suite do we realize that it's been moved elsewhere. We learn from a holotape that Chandrick left behind that Carl Oslo had the beryllium agitator moved to the reactor level in the deep basement of the building. It's after that request that Chandrick begins to put things together, and he realizes that this technology will be used by the military. He expresses his outrage. Calm down, Noel. You knew that this was coming. I don't understand why you're acting this way. Don't tell me to calm down, Carl. When we started designing the beryllium agitator, you said it would be for the benefit of mankind. Instead, I find out that you have been planning on turning it over to the military all along. You lied to me. Don't give me that high and mighty attitude. Have you picked up a newspaper lately? There's a war going on out there, Doctor. And if our side's going to win, it needs all the help it can get. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Since when did science start taking sides? What did they promise you, Carl? Money? Political favors? A goddamn medal? That's enough. Like it or not, when the testing cycle is completed, I'm crating up the agitator and sending it off to Washington. Now, you have two choices. Either you can get back to work, or you can get the hell out of my building. He goes on official record saying that he's opposed to accelerating his project schedule. And then he hashes it out with Oslo in person. We learn the ultimate fate of Mr. Chandrick. In a personnel terminal, we find a note from Reisenbauer, the HR coordinator, who says that Noel Chandrick has been terminated. Oslo threatens him, saying that if Chandrick gets work at any of Mass Fusion's competitors, then Mass Fusion will sue him. They also froze his pension and his benefits, meaning that he can't get additional work and he can't retire. Talk about cutting off someone's lifeline. We learn from the security terminal that all of the security at Mass Fusion is to inform Carl Oslo at once if they see Chandrick anywhere on premises. Despite their best efforts, they have not fully convinced the populace of Massachusetts that their energy truly is clean and not dangerous. We learn from the reception terminal that mass sit-in protests have been going on at the Mass Fusion building. Residents of Boston have been coming to protest Mass Fusion and the way they do business. The public is likely upset with Mass Fusion due to the way that they choose to dispose of nuclear waste. Mass Fusion is completely irresponsible with the way that they handle this disposal disposal process, but we'll cover this in another video. This has become a big security concern, which we learned from the security terminal. They've locked down all of the doors in and out. You can't enter or leave without an employee key card, and all of the employees are instructed to stay in their respective areas no wandering around. This lockdown would have made it even doubly hard for Noel Chandrick to come back to Mass Fusion. We find a key card in the executive suite that allows us to turn on the elevator to go down into Mass Fusion. As we go down the elevator, we are attacked by whichever enemy faction we've made in the game, either synths or Brotherhood of Steel soldiers. As we near the end of the elevator, they blow the power to the elevator, causing the elevator to drop. You then have to explore this upper level to restore power to the elevator. If you can't, you can get through an expert locked door to drop down a hole in the floor to reach the lower part of the building. Or you could hack into a terminal to reroute the power in the building to restore power to the elevator. Or you can climb up to the second floor and flip a circuit breaker which restores power. 
There, that's done it. Power's back online. Before you go down, you can access Tesla Science Magazine issue number five, which lies on a computer bank southeast of the mezzanine room. You should get it now while doing the main quest, otherwise you won't be able to get it again unless you come back later with a jetpack. Now there is a secret in this room, which can only be accessed if you have a jetpack. At the very top of the building, you can jump up between all of the floors until you find a hole in the wall at the top. This is where you find the Freefall Legs, a unique legendary item that negates all falling damage. These were developed by an intern named Jack Rockford. I created a different video telling the complete story on the Freefall Legs and this intern, which you can watch here. But for now, we'll move on deeper into the building. When you get to the very bottom, you find even more enemy soldiers. Once you clear them out, you can go down to the reactor level to complete the quest, or you can continue to explore to learn more of the backstory. It is up here that we find the records terminal. In this terminal, we learn that a man named Victor Summers is waiting for a personal answer from his co-worker, Jenny Berlin. He says, Have you given any thought to my proposal? You haven't said anything to me in over a week, and I'm afraid I've scared you away. It's clear that he is distraught. He sends her repeated messages asking for a response to his proposal. At last, he says that he's sick of waiting. I have plenty of others lining up to take your place, you know. If you don't let me know soon, I'm moving on to someone else. In his last entry, he regrets the ultimatum, and he says, Jenny, I've been a fool, an impatient, impolite fool. I've been bothering you for months about my proposal. I'm ready now to be patient. Take as long as you want, Jenny. Maybe after the holidays, you can give me your answer. Just outside his terminal, we do find a skeleton that looks like it's been crushed by an upper floor as it fell. What was this proposal? Well, the first thing that leaps to mind is it might have been a marriage proposal. We learn more when we access the mainframe control terminal. This was Jenny's station, and we can read her responses to Victor. She says, please stop emailing me, Victor. When I have an answer, I'll give it to you. I don't like being rushed. She responds to his later messages by saying, I'm not avoiding you, Victor. I'm trying to make the right decision. You're acting like this is a simple choice when it's clearly going to affect the rest of my life. Give me time, Vic. When the moment is right, and when I'm ready, I promise I'll come tell you in person. She responds to his ultimatum with surprising grace. She says, look, this is not something I would do just for anyone. The fact that you can't understand how personal this decision is makes me very upset. You say you have others lined up, but we both know that in our hearts you can only give what you have to me. The other girls are just jealous. Stop this and be patient, I'll have an answer soon. It looks like his last message where he apologized was received well. Jenny says, Vic, I know you're just trying to make me happy, and I know that I've been taking too long to answer, but I think I'm close to having an answer for you. In fact, why don't you come over for Thanksgiving dinner and we'll make this happen. Near to her terminal, we find a female skeleton crushed by the same fallen floor that crushed Victor. Their skeletons are separated by only a few feet, meaning that they died at the same time, possibly running to reach each other. Could it be that they at last found love? That Jenny finally agreed to marry him, and as their world crumbled around them, they only thought of each other and ran into each other's arms only to be crushed. Well, no, that's not the answer. We find the answer as we delve deeper into the building. Before you go back down, be sure to pick up the Strength Bobblehead, which you find sitting on top of the Steel Head Sculpture, which you can access by climbing over a couch at the top floor. Once this bottom portion beneath the glass is fully explored, you can take an elevator down to the reactor level. Once the doors open, you find the Facilities Terminal, and in this terminal, we learn exactly what it is that Victor was proposing to Jenny. In this terminal, we find a note from someone named Niles to Debbie Gregg in Reactor Facilities, and she says, Debbie, I don't know what to do. I had Jenny from Mainframe Control up here, and she was crying on my shoulder about that guy Victor in records. He keeps asking her to adopt his stupid puppy and won't leave her alone about it. What do you think I should tell her? Maybe I should talk to Victor and adopt the darn thing myself. So after all of that, it wasn't a marriage proposal. Victor wanted Jenny to adopt his puppy. All of the other girls lined up were not lined up to marry him. No, they were lined up to adopt his puppy. That's the big life-altering decision that Jenny had to take weeks to think about. Talk about a little bit of drama. But maybe what was only a dog adoption to Victor was turning into something a little more for Jenny. Maybe the weeks of emails that they exchanged with each other did kindle a small romance between the two. Otherwise, I can't explain why their skeletons are so close to each other in their final moments of life. 
in what is probably the most disturbing tale that we can walk away from mass fusion with is how the engineers who managed the nuclear reactor spent their free time. While making sure that every home in Boston had clean nuclear energy, the engineers were playing a role-playing game via email. <laughs> <laughs> this role-playing game story is told between four different terminals in the reactor level. I'm gonna piece them all together so that you get the full story of this fantasy game these engineers were playing. The players of this game were Thorpe, who ran the prototype terminal, Vincent, who ran the attendance terminal, Collins, who ran the reactor control terminal, and Wabash, who ran the analyst's terminal. Wabash was the dungeon master. Here's how the story starts. After dispatching the goblins, you enter a large chamber. The room is moist, dark, and reeks of offal. Shadow Fiend, you feel as though a thousand eyes are staring at you from the darkness, but your dark vision reveals nothing. Gandar, you notice that your sword is giving off a faint shimmer. Tamash, your spirit guardian whispers words of warning to you that something otherworldly is here. Shadow Fiend responds by looking for a safe corner. He draws both of his snakebite daggers. He crouches and says, Tamash, there's something amiss here. Tamash responds by reaching into his pouch and sprinkling his commuting dust in a circle around himself. He closes his eyes and calls upon the knowledge of Diligasa. Diligasa, sage of ages, show me what my eyes can't see. Gandar responds by drawing his demon blade from its scabbard. He waits for Tamasha's incarnation to take effect. He carefully watches the room for any sign of movement. But things do not go according to plan. Something was preventing Tamasha's summoning ritual from completing. Instead, all he could feel is the cold touch of something dark and primeval creeping upon his spine. This is clearly a threat from something otherworldly. By stopping his incantation. In the silence that follows, Shadow Fiend thinks he sees something slithering across the ceiling above Gandar. Shadow Fiend hurls his daggers at the slithering form and yells out, Gandar, above you, my friend! Tamash switches to his staff of brilliant sunlight. He incants the words and raises the staff high over his head to illuminate the room. At the top of his voice, he booms, Dark foe, prepare to be revealed! Gandar heeds the warning from his friend Shadow Fiend and attempts to sidestep the attack he's expecting. At the same time, he takes a mighty swing with his blade. But the corporeal monster they all expected is not there. Shadow Fiend's daggers clank against the cold stone ceiling as they seemingly pass through the shadowy, serpent like form. Tamash's spell would normally fill the chamber with pure sunlight, but something was preventing his magic from reaching its full potential, casting but a dim light in the room. Gandar's sword cleaves air as his blade passes through the enemy unharmed. In response, Tamash drops his staff. He reaches into his left front pocket and pulls out a pinch of sulfur powder. He incants the flame blaze spell and blows into the pile of powder towards the beast. Shadow Fiend removes his crossbow from its leather holster, notches in a clip of bolts, and takes careful aim at the creature. Using his power of true sight, he attempts to aim at the creature's weak point and fires. Gandar, stunned that his sword strike did not meet flesh, backs off from the ethereal creature. Realizing that the Hellspawn is made of pure magic and his weapon would be useless here. My friends, magic is the only thing that can stop this creature of darkness. He kneels down and says a quick prayer to Bashlar, God of Steel. And that is where the game ends, ladies and gentlemen. We do not know if Bashlar God of Steel answered the prayer of Gandar. We do not know if Shadow Fiend's crossbow bolt hit the magical creature. And we do not know if Tamash's flame blaze spell incinerated the beast. For before the four men could finish their game, the bombs dropped, destroying Mass Fusion, killing all of its employees, and likely ending the play of such fantasy role-playing games in the Commonwealth forever. Like I said, that is probably the most disturbing story that you could find in a nuclear reactor control room. I much prefer that they were not focused on playing their role-playing games and instead focused on making sure the reactor was safe. 
As you get close to the reactor, you find two sets of doors which can be controlled from nearby terminals. If you open them, you find Assaultrons and a giant sentry bot. Now you can activate them to destroy them here, and you can turn off the reactor security, which will deactivate the Protectrons and the turrets. But it's a much more satisfying battle to leave everything the way it is and to encounter them later which is what we're going to do here. Once you reach the reactor, Proctor Ingram sends you deep inside. Radiation levels are dangerously high in there. Let me know if you need any radiation protection. I'll communicate with you through their intercom system while I monitor everything from out here. You find the reactor highly irradiated. If you try to enter without a suit of power armor or a hazmat suit, you'll find your death to be quick and painless. The reactor is also flooded with feet of irradiated water. If you try to swim in it without protection, you die almost instantly. <laughs> If you try to drink the water, again, you die instantly. But it is worth swimming around down here because if you do, you find a trunk filled with randomized loot. Quite a lot of ammunition. At the top of the gantry, we find the nuclear reactor. You can open it up to retrieve the beryllium agitator. Once you have it, the security system activates. Chamber. Emergency lockdown initiated. If you destroyed the robots earlier or shut down the security system, your fight after this is not that tough. But if you didn't, all of the robots wake up, the turrets open fire, and you have to fight through two Assaultrons, one sentry bot, Protectrons, and ceiling mounted turrets. Sensor alert. Once done, you can go to the elevator to leave, but as you do, you find that the enemy faction has gotten reinforcements. The Institute must have sent reinforcements. I'll help hold them off. Just make sure you get the agitator out of here. You now have two choices. You can flee with the beryllium agitator and then hightail it back to your faction's headquarters. If you do, you find that without your help, your allied soldiers did not fare well. What ended up happening at Mass Fusion? Our troops did the best they could, but the synths overwhelmed them. We lost some good men back there, but at least we got the agitator. Alternatively, you can fight all of the enemy soldiers in this room until they're all gone. Engaging hostiles white force. Engaging If you do that, you can go back to your faction headquarters and you find that your faction now holds Mass Fusion. What ended up happening at Mass Fusion? Thanks to your help, our forces managed to take the building with very little resistance from the synths. We've posted a garrison there, and they'll keep the place under guard for the time being. If you sided with the Brotherhood of Steel with the Beryllium Agitator in hand, you can place it into Liberty Prime and activate the giant robot. Fusion Core reinitialized. Liberty Prime, full system analysis. All systems, nominal. Weapons, what? Mission, the destruction of any and all Chinese communists. Probability of Chinese victory, impossible. Brotherhood, salute! Victorium! Proceeding to target coordinates. Freedom is the sovereign Your right lives. of every American. Democracy is non-negotiable. Or, if you sided with the Institute, you can go to the reactor level of the Institute, where you find Father addressing the scientists. This, my friends, is the moment we've all worked towards. After all your effort, the time has finally come to start our reactor. No longer will we be forced to compromise to survive. No more will we need worry about outpacing our resources. 
My mother and I couldn't be more proud of what you have helped us accomplish. And we look forward to achieving even greater things in the future. The Institute is now truly mankind's best hope. Thank you. All of you. You can then place the beryllium agitator in the reactor and fire it up. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of the Mass Fusion Company and the Mass Fusion Building. As I said earlier, I will be talking about how Mass Fusion mismanaged their disposal process in an upcoming video. So be sure to subscribe so that you get a notification when I publish that video. What are your thoughts on Mass Fusion? I, for one, like the idea of clean nuclear power, and I'm so sad that it seems to be mismanaged everywhere you look. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you'd like to chat about this topic, Topic with other like-minded individuals on the Oxhorn Community Discord server, you can find an invitation link in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video today. Thank you for watching from the bottom of my heart, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video. About how to proceed. I'm not going.